Fred Rogers has to be one of the most beloved American TV personalities. There can't be many people in America who aren't familiar with his gentle style and friendly tone. The 2019 film, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, brought Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood to a new audience. Delivering his message of hope and kindness, the same year that brought us Joaquin Phoenix's unhinged Joker and Tarantino's violent Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. For those who don't know, and those who do, let's go over five reasons why Fred Rogers was the best neighbor ever. Number one, he got into TV to make it nicer. The first time Fred Rogers saw a TV show, it was something horrible with people throwing pies at one another. Rogers recognized that TV had incredible potential as it connected directly with people. Fred Rogers is quoted as saying, I went into television because I hated it so, and I thought there was some way of using this fabulous instrument to be of nurture to those who would watch it. There is no denying that he achieved this goal. According to him, the space between the television set and that person who is watching is very holy ground. Before studying child development at the University of Pittsburgh in the early 1960s, he became friends with child psychologist Dr. Margaret McFarland, who would help him infuse child development theory into his scripts. He taught social and emotional learning and strove to validate children's feelings and experiences. Overall, he wanted to give children the tools to cope with emotions, good and bad, and he saw television as the perfect platform to do this. He understood that television had the potential to be more than a source of entertainment. He felt that if he could reach people through this medium, it wouldn't just make television better, it might also make people's lives better. Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood first aired in the late 1960s. It was a time of change and people were becoming more open with their feelings instead of repressing emotions for respectability. Rogers said, Confronting our feelings and giving them appropriate expression always takes strength, not weakness. This message was important during a time when people were, for the first time, witnessing images of the horrors of war on their television sets. Rogers felt that television should not be a passive pastime, but should be used as an interactive tool to help and shape individuals. Using low-tech production and simple sets, Rogers veered away from the regular children's programming that focused on the Wild West or slapstick humor. Instead, he placed the emphasis of the show on kindness, understanding, and education. Instead of a show that kids sat back and watched, he wanted to present a television visit. The show started with Mr. Rogers taking off his formal jacket and putting on his sweater and sneakers. He engaged directly with the audience looking into the camera and using a conversational style of talking. Mr. Rogers helped kids make sense of the world around them by covering a wide range of difficult topics. He said, The world is not a kind place. That's something all children learn for themselves, whether we want them to or not. But it's something they really need our help to understand. In the following years, many shows committed to a similar format, including Sesame Street, Reading Rainbow, and The Electric Company. Number two, he advocated tolerance and acceptance. Mr. Rogers was not one to shy away from important issues, especially regarding human rights and the acceptance of others. In many instances, Rogers challenged the status quo and opened up meaningful discussions. On one episode in 1981, he invited a boy named Jeff Erlanger onto his show. Erlanger had paraplegia, and Rogers questioned him about his wheelchair and condition with compassion and dignity, allowing Erlanger to challenge any stigma regarding his disability. Erlanger grew up to be a disability rights advocate, and in 1999, he had the opportunity to publicly address Rogers, saying, When you tell people that it's you I like, you know that you really mean it. And tonight, I want to let you know that on behalf of millions of children and grown-ups, it's you that I like. In relation to the Cold War, Rogers demonstrated issues surrounding conflict and tackled heavy subjects, such as the accumulation of weapons and what drives leaders to go to war. He advises his viewers to look for the helpers. You will always find people are helping. Words that still encourage people today, allowing them to see the light in the darkest moments. Perhaps the most famous way Mr. Rogers encouraged inclusion and acceptance 
was by casting singer Francois Clemens as the neighborhood policeman, Officer Clemens. Clemens was shocked when he learned that Rogers wanted him to play a police officer, as his experience of the police force while growing up as an African American in the inner city had soured his view of law enforcement. Rogers convinced him to take the part by stating that it was important for children to see that there are kind and friendly officers. He also promised Clemens would have many opportunities to sing on the show. Amid the civil rights movement, when segregation was still practiced in many areas, Clemens was the first African American to have a recurring role on a children's TV show. Rogers knew that some public swimming pools still prohibited Caucasians and African Americans from swimming together. So in one episode, he invited Officer Clemens to join him in cooling his feet in a pool of water. When they were done, Rogers shared his towel with Clemens, and they both dried their feet. This simple act showed many of his young viewers that issues surrounding race were unfounded and born out of fear and hatred. However, Rogers knew some issues could not be tackled by a kid's show in the 1960s and 1970s. In a memoir by Francois Clemens, he revealed that Rogers had told him that he would lose his role if he came out as gay. According to Clemens, Rogers confronted him about his sexuality, saying, Someone has informed us that you were seen at the local gay bar downtown. Now, I want you to know, Frank, that if you're gay, it doesn't matter to me at all. Whatever you say and do is fine with me. But if you're going to be on the show as an important member of the neighborhood, you can't be out as gay. After this revelation, Clemens began to cry and asked Rogers if it meant the end of their friendship. Rogers immediately hugged his friend, reassuring him that their relationship would remain unchanged. So Clemens stayed firmly in the closet and married a woman to keep up the pretense. In the years that followed, and as people started to be more openly gay after the Stonewall riots of 1969, Rogers changed his mind and allowed Clemens to retain his role on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood after he divorced his wife and came out as gay in 1974. Rogers welcomed Clemens' gay friends who visited the set and urged him to get into a long-term same-sex relationship. However, he still would not allow any mention of it on the show and required Clemens to remove his earring when appearing on the program. Despite all this, Clemens never resented Rogers and understood that his sexuality would threaten the future of the show. He later stated, it was not a personal statement of how he felt about me. It had to do with the economics of the show. And I relied on the fact that this was his dream. He had worked so hard for it. I knew Mr. Rogers' neighborhood was his whole life. Although Rogers didn't tackle gay rights head on, he did engage in subtle activism. As a Presbyterian minister, evangelicals would sometimes ask him to condemn homosexuality publicly. Rogers would simply reply, God loves everyone just the way they are. Rogers displayed acceptance through actions, not just words, and his displays of unconditional acceptance won the hearts and minds of his viewers. His kindness was so well-known and infectious that when news outlets ran the story that his old Impala had been stolen, the car was returned to the spot it was taken, with a note reading, If we had known it was yours, we never would have taken it. Number 3 he saved public television and the VCR. Not only did Fred Rogers understand the value of television, but he also publicly fought for it. In 1969, President Richard Nixon proposed cutting the funding for public television. Mr. Rogers' neighborhood had just been syndicated nationally, and upon hearing the news, Rogers traveled to Washington, D.C. to try and change their minds. He appeared before Congress and gave a speech about the importance of public television and how his show helped children navigate their emotions in a healthy way. He argued that he was providing a service for mental health, helping children understand that emotions are both mentionable and manageable. When he started his speech, he faced a group that had already decided to cut funding to public television. By the end of his testimony, Senator John Pastor of Rhode Island admitted that he had goosebumps and remarked, Looks like you just earned that $20 million. In the 1970s, Rogers would be instrumental in another case. In 1975, the Betamax video recorder was introduced to America. This futuristic bit of kit promised that it could time shift television programs so that they could be watched at a more convenient time. 
While most people were wowed at the thought of this incredible technology, large studios were less than impressed. In 1976, Universal Studios and Walt Disney Productions filed a lawsuit to halt the sale of the Betamax, claiming that producers would lose millions of dollars through unauthorized copying and distribution of their content. The case outlasted the popularity of Betamax and eventually went to the Supreme Court in 1983, when VCRs were in almost half of American homes. The head of the Motion Picture Association, Jack Valenti, argued, the VCR is to the American film producer and the American public as the Boston Strangler is to the woman home alone. On the other side of the case, Rogers testified with his usual calm dignity, saying, I have always felt that with the advent of all this new technology that allows people to tape the neighborhood off the air, they then become more active in the programming of their family's television life. I feel that anything that allows a person to be more active in the control of his or her life in a healthy way is important. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of the VCR's maker, Sony, and agreed with Rogers that it is a real service to families to be able to record children's programs and to show them at appropriate times. Number 4. He Preferred the Personal Touch Fred Rogers, as Mr. Rogers, was inseparable from his show, and just as his character reflected his real personality, he incorporated many aspects of his life into the show. Rogers had received a degree in music in 1951 and composed all the songs on the show himself. He knew he wanted to deliver great music, so Rogers persuaded gifted jazz musician Johnny Costa to work with him, telling him he wanted to give children the best. Rogers wrote over 200 songs, penning the melodies and the lyrics, but giving Costa the freedom to arrange the music in a more sophisticated way. As well as putting himself into the show, he included several family members by naming characters after them. Queen Sarah was named after his wife, and the postman was given the same name as his beloved maternal grandfather, Mr. McFeely. He also included friends, calling a striped tiger puppet Daniel after Dorothy Daniel, the station manager who had given Rogers a tiger puppet before the show premiered. Rogers' wife and kids appeared on the show several times, allowing the viewers to get a glimpse of his real life. Due to his honest approach to the production, he made it clear that the house on the show was not his real house. But probably the sweetest way he included his family was by wearing the sweaters that his mother knitted. These sweaters became as iconic as the man himself and were a way for him to pay tribute to his mother, Nancy Rogers, and show viewers that people expressed love in many ways, including spending the time to create homemade gifts. Number 5. He helped Michael Keaton get into show business. After graduating from college, one of Michael Keaton's first jobs was working for a public broadcasting service in Pittsburgh, where they filmed Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. He worked as a production assistant, pitching in wherever he could. Keaton's first time on screen was in early episodes of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, where he played one of the Flying Zucchini Brothers, and he is quoted as saying, I'm pretty sure I dressed up as Black and White Panda. Keaton clearly had a lot of respect for Mr. Rogers, saying, Fred was a really nice man and had a really great sense of humor, and he was one of the nicest, authentically good people you've ever met. After Rogers died in 2003, Keaton hosted a PBS memorial tribute, and in 2018, he hosted a 50th anniversary special of the series called Mr. Rogers, It's You I Like. So, without Mr. Rogers, we might have ended up with Beetlejuice being played by Arnold Schwarzenegger or Pierce Brosnan as Batman. If that doesn't make him a good neighbor, I don't know what does. How would you like to get a deeper understanding of history, impress your friends, and predict the future more accurately based on past events? If this sounds like something you might be into, then check out the brand new Captivating History Book Club by clicking the first link in the description. To learn more about the history of America, check out our book, Fred Rogers, A Captivating Guide to the Man Behind Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. If you found the video captivating, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.